We are very glad that we have been uh, joined by a uh, very wonderful uh, person. He is a doctor in the Maruf International Hospital. He is also the MBBS and also a member of the Royal College of the Surgeons of Edinburgh in the UK. We are very glad that we have been joined by Dr. Amir Abdul Wahid. He is a consultant in emergency medicine. Assalamu alaikum and thank you so much for coming. Uh, Walaikum salam and thanks for having me. Right. So, Dr. Saab, uh, International Emergency Medicine Day, your safety our priority is the theme. What exactly is yeah, I think medicine is a branch of medicine which deals with the uh, diagnosis and treatment of unforeseen injury and illness. Say if somebody has an accident, uh, if somebody has uh, an accident, uh, he is brought to the emergency department. Likewise, somebody having a chest pain or a stroke uh, is brought to the emergency department. And similarly, people with sudden abdominal pains and problem with breathing and all those things. So we deal with the very first hour of an, an emergency where uh, life and death decisions can be made. And, uh, and it, makes, uh, it, really, uh, dif it makes the difference there. Right, so we've also seen, uh, especially, so you talked about the golden hour before our discussion, before we went on air, and you talked about, the, it's a very important hour in dealing with the patient. So, um, being a photographer, I am aware of the, what does the golden hour means, but obviously in the medicine, the term has a very changed connotation. So, what exactly is the golden hour? Yeah, uh, this is actually, this, uh, this uh, golden hour was coined in respect of the trauma, but now I think it's very uh, true for rest of the diseases as well, as well. So what actually happens in an accident that there are a trimodial pattern of death. Uh, unfortunately, someone dies on the spot at the scene. That is an immediate death. And then right. you have an early death, which happens within an hour to a couple of hours. Right. And then you have a late death, which happens in the days and, and the months. Right. So this is the second part of the death, which is, we said, the right. early part where that golden hour comes into play. And right. if during that one hour, mm -hmm. uh, the patient gets the right diagnosis and the treatment, mm -hmm. uh, the outcome is different. So right. th that's why we always say that whenever there is an accident, it's very important that the patient is taken to a right place where right diagnosis can be made and he can be treated promptly. So that's the right. importance of the golden hour. Similarly, in cases of sepsis, where you have patients who are having infection, blood infection, mm -hmm. uh, the first hour is very important because mm -hmm. during that very first hour, if we can take the blood samples and give them the antibiotics, mm -hmm. uh, studies have shown that this improves their outcome right. and survival. So right. that's, I think, in the longer run, in an emergency department, the first hour is the golden hour in all aspects of the disease. Right. Right. So, Dr. Saab, so you are one of the few people in Pakistan, I think four to five people, uh, who are trained in the medicine, in the emergency medicine, right? And that is, uh, alhamdulillah, a very distinguished uh, position that you hold. And you alluded to something earlier on in your conversation, which is that you need to have the right sort of diagnosis, especially when there's a trauma or when there's an emergency. There. So, what do you mean by the right diagnosis? diagnosis uh, in the first place, what does this connotation have uh, when it comes to the medical diagnosis? Because obviously diagnosis, uh, do you feel that the diagnosis can be wrong in a lot of times? Uh, uh, I think uh, one thing I just want, I have felt and I have seen patients of that nature is that Pakistan has a very high percentage of diabetics. And whenever a diabetic uh, has a heart attack, mm -hmm. they don't get a classical signs of the heart attack, which is that they will get a chest pain or they will pain will go to the arm and the door, but they might simply have something called an indigestion, right. a pain in the upper part of the abdomen. Right. And those are the patients which if you, you go to any local clinic mm. or a quack way, which where they have not been trained mm. to, and they have been yes. not told that this could be a sign of heart attack, so there it can be missed. So if you're coming to a proper place, we know that this is something which is a heart attack right. and we work towards that right. so the emergency medicine actually works to rule out the life-threatening problems first right. and then we go down and say okay now yes. that we have ruled out the heart attack let's mm. look at the other causes of the abdo pain 
Right. Yeah. So, Dr. Sub, since you're the expert in the field of uh, emergency medicine, and um, you alluded to the uh, antibiotics, so, so there's this conversation which is going on about how we need to curtail uh, the impact of antibiotics because there's a lot of resistance to so immunity developing, especially yeah. among the population through excessive use of the antibiotics, right? Um, so, does antibiotic fall under the emergency medicine? And uh, what do you have to say on this debate regarding the antibiotics and on the policy level? Uh, so, what are the recommendations that you would like to suggest out to the people who matter in this country? I think uh, everywhere in the developed world, there is, uh, in every hospital, there is an antibiotic stewardship program right. where uh, there are certain antibiotics which are only uh, prescribed by infectious diseases consultants. Right. Unfortunately, in Pakistan, uh, we have not, not s that type of control in the hospitals especially right. and then in the general practice as well. Right. We can write the third generation and the fourth generation antibiotics without even having the proper uh, culture and sensitivity reports. Right. So I think uh, quite a few hospitals and like my hospital we are uh, embarking on these things of developing this antibiotic stewardship program Wonderful. where not everyone can write every antibiotic and right. that's the way forward I think right. we have to even in the policy making we have to bring this as uh, a mandatory for all the hospitals to have an antibiotic stewardship program right. the uh, the resistance which is developing is just because we are writing antibiotics indigenously without having consideration for the culture and sensitivity reports. Yes. So, Dr. Saab, let's develop uh, something which you alluded to in our conversation, which is about quackery and fake spiritual healers in Pakistan. And in Pakistan, we have seen this trend um, that people generally would like to, and, and it's not just limited to the rural areas. It's so the trend which is quite popular in the urban areas too. Like people don't go to the doctors if they have their, any problem when it comes to the physical health. Rather, they would trust these fake spiritual healers and quackery. And we know that how bad that can go in the first place, right? And obviously, uh, they justify uh, the, the, I mean, belief and the existence of that disease from the spiritual angle, from the religious angles, like Allah ne aisa likha wa tha, ya hamare mukaddar mein aisi aani thi, pain aana tha, something like that, right? Um, so how can we? Obviously, that is a misrepresentation of Islam. We have seen that Islam has produced very flourishing uh, intellectuals who were really good in the medicine and so on, the theology. For example, Jabir bin Hayyan, Ibn Hatim, and whatnot, right? Um, so how can we curtail this tendency, especially among the people, that they go to the right person at the right time and get their diagnosis timely? Because you know it's sad about it. The cure is always better. Uh, sorry, prevention is always better than cure. Something like that, right? Yeah. Uh, so how do you convince those pa patients? Uh, I mean, who have beliefs like this, but obviously it's a misrepresentation. Yeah, I think uh, this is what I am here today just to create that awareness about this thing. I think information is one thing and yes. then you provide the proper medical services around the doorsteps. Right. If you have a proper well-developed uh, primary healthcare system right. and then you have that facilities available then people will not go to the quacks and yes. the clinics where uh, are the faith healers. But uh, it, I think it's mainly it's about yes. the information yes. and about providing the facilities around the doorsteps and I hope that if we do these two steps probably uh, the, these things will definitely uh, slowly uh, vein, vein. But the other thing is that our regulators, the Islamabad Healthcare mm -hmm. Regulatory Authority is taking a lot of measures in that, right. that they are cracking down on the quacks yes. and is trying to uh, control these things. Yes, yes, they, they, there is an effort to cr uh, have this crackdown on it, but you, we will see that they will uh, then again spring up in some form or in another form yeah. and, and they're very popular among the people. But uh, moving on our conversations and let's back uh, go back to our concept of universal access towards the healthcare, right? I think Pakistani state is doing wonderfully well in this regard, considering the fact that we do not have that much of our resources as compared to Western countries and uh, the healthcare is extremely expensive there. Um, so what is exactly your hospital Maruf International doing in popularizing the uh, universal healthcare access? Uh, I think, uh, being a private hospital, we uh, and uh, and being the medical director as well. We are uh, following a path where we are trying to make the healthcare affordable for all the population right. within the community. And I think access to healthcare is uh, resource dependent, which mm -hmm. I'm sure you would mm -hmm. also like uh, know that uh, this all costs, uh, but we need to make sure that this healthcare is uh, accessible for the masses as well. And 
on that regard, we do a, we keep in mind that all of our patients are not the same. They can't pay the same amount of money. So. Right. Whenever some patient walks into our emergency department, mm -hmm. we don't look at their status, whether they can pay or not. Right. We look at the disease, what they are coming with. Right. We provide them that treatment. And believe you me, there have been instances where we have uh, taken the patients from the emergency to the cath lab to open up their blocked heart arteries without even having uh, a conversation about their payment. Right. And I'm really thankful to the uh, to our management and to the owners of the hospital that yes. they actually take that t as a mission right. and uh, I think that's something which I would like all the private hospitals to follow in that regard. Right, that's wonderful. So um, as it is said, especially in the uh, everyday adage about it that uh, prevention is always better than cure, right? So Dr. Saab, we see that there's this general tendency where you see that the diseases are on the rise in general in Pakistan. You would see that the diabetes is uh, inflating, uh, so are the obesity and sugar and other diseases. Um, so do you think that there's something wrong with the way we are uh, living or our living standards needs to improve a lot? because the element of mobility is very much reduced now. So we uh, go on our cars, we don't walk that much and um, that immobility is contributing a lot of the uh, factors, right? Um, so what do you have to say in this regard? I, I tell you, I think there's a very interesting st uh, statistic just came out last week that Pakistan is the highest number of diabetic patients in the world. About 33% of our population is diabetic. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, a lot. And it brings in itself a very heavy burden on the health system as well. And how can you prevent diabetes is that uh, you need to uh, take dietary advice, you need to get yourself regularly checked, mm -hmm. and you need to, if some very, very few, very, a lot of people are pre-diabetics, that oh. uh, before the diabetics is actually diagnosed, mm -hmm. if they can get their blood sugars checked, they can take those uh, necessary steps of avoiding the sugars and carbs, mm -hmm. uh, starting to, have mobility, changing their lifestyle, changing yes. their food, that they can actually delay the onset of diabetes. Wonderful. And diabetes is the major uh, problem for heart disease. It's a precursor for heart disease, it's a precursor for hypertension, yes. and so on, so on forth. Yes. So I think prevention, as you said, is better yes. than cure. Yes. And how does the prevention come? Mm -hmm. Is by early testing, get your blood pressure regularly checked, right. get your sugar regularly checked, and in, and change your lifestyle in, yes. mm, and start doing some exercises. I think that's going to help a lot. That's very true. Uh, so you mentioned about the pre-diabetic condition, right? So how can we identify a condition which is about to develop, right? Yeah. Uh, so what are the symptoms that we should be cognizant of if they happen or they're going to happen in the future? Yeah, uh, I think if you have a family history of diabetes, okay. uh, say from one of your parents or both parents, then you're very likely to develop diabetes. Okay. So the thing is that once you cross 40, uh, you need to look at your blood sugars once every few months, mm -hmm. uh, get your fasting blood sugar checked and see if it is on the rising trend. There is another test called an HbA1c, okay. which actually gives you the blood level of your sugars for the last three months. So if you can get that done, and that can give you actually a trend whether it's on the rising side or the lower side. Right. Uh, so once you pick it up there, then you can change your lifestyle and food and then you can prolong uh, the onset uh, of the healthy uh, life, health, right? Yeah. So thank you so much, Dr. Saab, for putting it out there brilliantly. One last question before we wrap up this segment, which is about the role of the painkillers and the self-medication. So we see that people, a lot of the times, they're self-medicating. So um, any small pain they have, they would have the painkiller. So is it a very effective practice? And if not, so what needs to be changed in this regard? I just tell you something on the lighter note I read. Uh, in a hospital, there was a sticker there that uh, if you have uh, search your disease on the Google and you want a second <laughs> opinion, you can look at yahoo.com. Yeah. So yes. that's not what uh, I think we should uh, uh, advocate. Yes. Uh, we need to make sure that we don't self-medicate because we see a lot of patients with kidney diseases yes. which are self-inflicted by the people okay. with the indiscriminate use of 
painkillers. Oh, yeah. okay. So we have to be very cognizant of the fact that we don't use painkillers without consulting a doctor. Right. This is very important. Right, right. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Saab, for coming here, for enlightening us about what does the International uh, Emer Me Emergency Medicine Day means about and what is exactly an emergency medicine. And obviously, there is this trend, especially Dr. Saab alluded to it, where um, people are inflicting a lot of diseases on themselves by the very indiscriminate use of the painkillers. So we do have two extremes in our society. So there is this extreme who do not tolerate any amount of the pain. So they, uh, uh, when it very, they would fetch the painkiller and uh, eat it and then there's another extreme which would say that you know we need to tolerate because tolerance is good and it's a virtue which is admired in a society so I think um, we need to have a moderation and go to the expert in this field who are the doctors who can tell you more about what's wrong with your body don't self-medicate and with that we will end up our segment then once again we'll say thank you uh, to you Dr. Saab for coming here for having this very enlightened discussion about it and until next time it's a goodbye Allah Hafiz.